Greetings in God the Father and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It seems like it's been quite a while since we've had a chance to visit, and I have looked forward to it and wish each of you a happy new year, a blessed new year in the Lord. We'll see how we, we go today. I was considering giving the prophetic word for 2023, but I, I chose to uh, cover a few things first. The prophetic word for 2023 leading into 2024 and 2025 is, for some, it'd be hard to believe. Uh, there uh, are dark days ahead, uh, but they're not totally dark. There are good areas, and it's what the Lord wanted me to talk about today. Um, but I, I'll cover a few things first and see how it goes. I'm uh, adjusting to new lights and trying to <laughs> hold my notes and all the stuff. So it's always I look forward to being with you. And as I said, think of visiting with you. Let's see if we can. You saw that uh, we posted for 2023, uh, the year of retribution, and it's the year of the camel. And if you saw that on Facebook, uh, I put a short teaching on there. Retribution in the sense of those that uh, are going to incur judgment on themselves. Uh, many have gone for a long period of time and they have not heeded the warnings uh, of, of the Lord and they have become more hardened and more hardened and more hardened. On the other hand, uh, for you and I, those that have held firm, we've done our best to uh, continue to be a light in, in an area of darkness. Uh, this year will be a, a time uh, to restore uh, many of the things that we've lost and to, it's like a camel, I said, uh, when they retain so much water, they're able to go through those difficult times. But I believe for many of you that this is also the time of new, fresh living water, and we know that is of Jesus Christ. So I want to cover a few things today. And I, for this year, I've been praying, and it will be more so. This is a difficult time, as it was in 2022 for farmers. Uh, the cost of supplies, uh, the cost of their fuel, the shortage of anyone that wants to do any type of farm labor, and the government regulations, federal level and state level, and those that live in, in California know how difficult uh, those regulations are uh, that they continue to pass that just hurts our farmers. So supply chain, we'll see prices go up. Uh, it's difficult for the farmers. So uh, please, uh, the wisdom warriors and the, the Bereans and those that pray with us, uh, help us lift up the farmers this year. We are in, in so much gratitude for them and appreciate what they do. Uh, the farming life uh, compared to the way the nation started out is so much different now. So let me, um, as I said, each year we'll, uh, I'll try to make introductions a little bit shorter, but we'll see how it goes. For those that want prayers, and we've had a lot uh, over the holidays, and we're, we're very thankful that you write to us and entrust with us. It's been over a year now, and, and you see that we never give out names or talk about particular individuals. Uh, we do pray for you. We lift you up before the Lord along with him. He is uh, your intercessor, and we join with him, Kimberly and I, and, and Luke join, and we have nightly devotion. Your letters that you send in, each one of them are read, and, and we're thankful for those that have made donations. You, <laughs> The lights that are everywhere around me now. Uh, the the monitors that we have, everything uh, in, in just trying to, to give you a better quality uh, presentation. But for the pictures, uh, you can, those that started out with me, I, I did like I, I did in Bible studies and small teachings. I passed out uh, colored uh, paper pictures, but uh, now we're a little, uh, moving to a little different. So let me start just a few things um, that I'll talk about this year. And um, they are maybe not taught in the church. I'll put it that way, or 
not covered a lot in the news, but let me just mention a few of these things and then get in uh, the teaching for today. But let me take you to a boring time about 26 years ago. And I have these notes because there's so much uh, those that, that watch know that I started out just as an intercessor. And for years, uh, the Lord has taught me and been teaching me. And I try the best I can to relay that to you. So as we get started, I thank you for our wisdom warriors, our sage warriors, intercessors from uh, throughout the nation and in so many other uh, countries of the world that join us and, and use these teachings uh, for a, some of them for their church and others for their Bible studies. So let me talk about this one aspect and get into the others. Uh, the ancient date in man's spiritual pursuit of life without God one of those is on July 5th, 1996. And that's when Dolly came into the world. You may remember that Dolly was a clone of a sheep. That's been 26 years ago. And I wanted to just, uh, why would you mention that, Jim? When I went to give a prophetic word, the things the Lord is showing to me uh, back uh, several years ago when he gave me the 10-year vision out to 2028 each year he comes back and reminds me of different aspects of that for the year uh, that five-hour vision was like drinking from a fire hydrant and i know that um those that have visions those that that have dreams uh, often it, 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 there's a lot of information that the lord shares with you and you have to go back and um just pray and ask him to reveal more and more and, and more to you. So, but it says since Dolly, many other animals have been cloned, including pigs, deer, horses, and bulls. Chinese biotechnicians report a 70 to 80% success rate for cloned pigs. And the Korean company's S O O A M biotech produces 500 cloned embryos a day. First clone primates were produced in China uh, in 2017, and in 2019, five identical uh, gene-edited clone monkeys were produced. This goes back to uh, when Dolly was done in 1996. What is that, Jim? If I share with you what he has shown to me for not only this year, 2024, but especially when a lot of this will hit in 2025. Um, cloning, uh, doing everything possible to create life without God. Uh, we, you know there are two basic beliefs in the world today. Uh, one from universities and schools that is taught that has, if, if you are a genuine scientist and uh, you know, you didn't worry about your career. Or you didn't worry about your colleagues. You know that Darwinism has been disproved over and over and over. And yet uh, the desire to have some type of creation without God is still their religion. Uh, Big Bang and, and all of those things. Uh, we know that God uh, created from Genesis. I'll be talking about those things uh, this year. Then it says, intriguingly, an extinct Korean ibex, P-Y-R-E-N-E-A-N, -E -E ibex, it was uh, extinct. So if you think of the movie Jurassic Park, you say, well, they, you know, they can't do cloning. And Jurassic Park is on the theory that they were able to get blood out of a mosquito and reproduce all of the dinosaurs. They said they were cloned in 2009 but unfortunately died shortly after birth from lung defects. Well, they should know that the atmosphere today is entirely different and could not sustain that type of life form uh, because of our atmosphere and, and, and some other things. Uh, let me cover one other in, in this one. Uh, Louise Brown, the world's first test tube baby, was born by IVF in 1978. Since then, more than 8 million children have entered the world through this technique. 
So when I looked at that and the Lord showed me what is ahead, it really, not. I'm not a scientist. I study the things he wants me to do and, and medically. But I said, Lord, if I were to tell them or, or show them some of the things or try to describe some of the things you've shown to me, I don't think they'd believe it. Um, so I'm covering these ahead of time to try to get you thinking in those areas. This goes back to 26 years. Over 8 million uh, children born out of a test tube said there can be little doubt that humans will be cloned. That's what this uh, article is on, on Dolly. And I, and I put this line, the arrogance, uh, and the question in this article was, should this be stopped with a question mark? No, it is what we do, according to the scientists. To those who ask what good will come of it, the reply is attributed to, their reply is attributed similar to Benjamin Franklin, who watched the first human balloon flight in Paris. So he watched a balloon flight in Paris and later to uh, Michael Faraday when asked about electromagnetism, electromagnetism, what good is it? The reply was, what good is a newborn baby? We don't know, but it has potential. This is the arrogance of these people. Now they can spin it and say they're trying to do it for, for many good reasons. Um, but the essence of many of those, these are atheists that continue to try and create life without God, my father and your father through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me go to a couple others just as to get you to thinking about those. Um, three years ago, I or two years ago, I helped arrange a meeting in Anthem, uh, Arizona with some other Christians, uh, some that uh, do broadcast and uh, several uh, key investors and others, um, and we met at a media company that is owned, Christian owned, and, and operated there in Anthem. And the Lord had had me share with him a vision that he had given to me several years earlier uh, about space. And, and the, I had shown those little pictures from a book and put it on a projector and, and presented to them. But at that time, the Lord said, in the next few years, talking about going to through today and 24 and 25, uh, it's going to all be about space. It is a race for space and uh, domination in space. And like I said, that was two years ago. And it says the race for space, the heavens from God's perspective for the next uh, number of years. And at that time, God had also shown me, the Lord showed me uh, his network, that he would have a network uh, that basically was for an underground church that operated at that time. And at that time, it's very dark days uh, leading up to uh, the abomination of desolation. So we talked about space and God's network. So let me talk about that for just a, a, a second. Um, Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, scientists has confirmed the very existence, and I've talked about this before, of the fourth dimension that Albert Einstein once predicted but could never prove. Uh, one of the most brilliant uh, scientists ever in, in the world, but uh, his theory was proved uh, because they had or they have supercomputers. It says that Einstein got it right, said Richard O'Shaughnessy, who works at RIT, the uh, Rochester Institute. He said the discovery would not have been possible without some key breakthrough research uh, capability using supercomputers to turn the theory into a formula, which led to the breakthrough. So, Jim, why are you covering this? There are so many things that are going to be taking place in space. And I have talked to you about the fourth dimension. Uh, when the Lord allows me this year, as I continue through, I will talk to you about the sixth and the seventh dimension that the Bible talks about, actually, and I'll cover that with you says, we see the world around us in three dimensions. Back to this article, Einstein predicted a fourth, which he calls space and time. He theorized that energy from colliding black holes causes gravitational waves that pass through objects without changing. We now have learned in this time that space is finite. And what we would see in the past as empty is not empty at all. 
uh, space is physical. Time is a physical. Space is a physical reality. Uh, it's mentioned one time by Paul, but most people don't catch that, uh, where you have um, energy, you have mass, you have velocity, and you also have gravity. And that's the areas of Einstein. It says, but I, to this point, it says the discovery also confirms the existence of black holes. And if you're like Luke <laughs> and in and, and his generation, they see things, so many things are about stargates or about wormholes or about portals. And those are the things that I have seen, I have looked at. I think one of the top series is Skinwalker Ranch, but it's talked about often. And, and Luke had me over the holidays. We watched one that uh, had, he uh, he's fascinated with Bigfoot and, and all those creatures. And I've told him what I thought it was from, uh, from what the Lord had, had shared with me over the last years. And this show that came on the History Channel basically confirmed that. So when I look at that, uh, the fourth dimension, just to give you an idea, uh, we see everything in, in we can see in three dimension. The artwork of one individual is the only one that captured it. Uh, the crucifixion bout, you can see it, Salvador Dali, D-A-L-I, in 1954. And you can see the URL. You can stop the uh, video and check that U URL out if, if you want to. So fourth dimension, Jim, you mentioned a, a, a six and a seven. Well, there's also a fifth. So we see the world around us in three dimensions. Let me mention one other one. CERN, um, looking for the God particle, this article, are opening portals to hell. Uh, this uh, fourth dimension that they discovered in 2016, confirming for Einstein in 2016, this was an article in, in the Wall Street Journal. It says the God particle are opening portals. Uh, CERN is seeking secrets of the universe or maybe opening the portals of hell. Regarding the large Hadron, H-A-D-R-O-N collider, which is a 17 mile uh, sub subterranean loop beneath France, Switzerland, border in Geneva. So it's 17 miles beneath the ground and that's where they are colliding the, the God particle. They, this year, if you just Google, there are updates on it. They have just modified uh, their super collider. Uh, they've spent about 21 billion on it. And it's interesting that in this, uh, I looked and said, it's too early to tell, but now China is also joining the quest to build its own uh, particle smasher, five times more powerful than CERN's HLC. And as Europe and China both race in search of the God particle. So there uh, is what the Lord had uh, shown to me several years ago when I met with these, uh, this group and shared with him. And said the Lord said it's in space and some of the different things he, he has shown to me, I was able to share that with him. So one other, and then we'll move to our teaching today, B'nai Halloween. The, the name Elohim, we're familiar with that. And I'll talk about that later. What are the sons of God that talked about in Genesis 6? That will probably be uh, the next teaching. We know that the Nakash, uh, that serpent, is the first in Genesis of trying to disrupt and destroy the seed of man. Then you had the second, which is what I'll talk about the next time. And I'll return back to Babylon, which was a third effort uh, led by Nimrod. And I'll talk a little bit about him today. But I wanted also then to leave with you the three questions that I had mentioned several teachings ago about, you can see, this is from the American Heritage Dictionary, extraterrestrial, there's the definition, originating, locating, or occurring outside Earth or its atmosphere, originating or located or occurring outside Earth or its atmosphere. So the three questions I gave to you to write for the Bereans was, has there ever been extraterrestrial beings on Earth? Question one. Two is, if so, is there documentation or a historical record? 
And then number three, if there is a historical record, has there been a transfer of knowledge or technology? It's interesting if you study on uh, unidentified aerial phenomena now, UAPs, which uh, they changed that from uh, UFOs, that there are actually millions that if you separate out those that um, are not as genuine uh, as others or are, are seeking some type of publicity or, or, or just, you know, We'll talk about that, about um, there are many people uh, over at this point between five and 10 million that uh, they are many of the universities. They won't tell you this, but they have studied those that have claimed to be abducted. So there are phenomena that are going on in the heavens that uh, our churches don't talk about. And it's one of the things that I do uh, want to if the Lord has shown to me, he's taught me on it and I want to share it, but share it uh, from a biblical standpoint and then document and back it up so that it's not sensationalized, but something that we can be aware of. As I have said, the Lord has had me uh, for you, my family uh, and the friends is to continue to teach me to the word so that you and I are not deceived. There is a great deception that is coming. So with that, let me move into today. But that's just some things to think about. Uh, uh, the cloning, uh, people searching for other ways other than God, uh, messing with the God particle, uh, the different things that are going on now with uh, gateways, portals. Um, and I'll show that uh, to you in our teaching today. For the United States of America, is there hope? And um, I have said that uh, in the past that there's no great national revival that's going to happen. And I know that disappointed those that have been taught or uh, attend these conferences that uh, continue to say that there's going to be a national revival. Uh, let me show you what he wanted me to share today. And what I do in my teaching is present to you scriptures. And as the Bereans did with the Apostle Paul, I ask you to just search out the scriptures. And I present to you historical facts and data so that you can re review it and then make up your own mind. Don't go by what I say. Take the time to look at it and evaluate it and pray over it and ask Holy Spirit to confirm with you what it is for you. I know what the Lord has shared with me. I'll present that to you. And in other times, I will present what others believe that may be different from my views, uh, if it's appropriate. So with where we're at today, secular humanism, if, if you don't believe that, then I, I don't know what else to tell you that and I'm talking primarily just about the United States of America, the great eagle that I love and I know you love with all your heart. Secular humanism, that's what we see in our face. Uh, and the, the networks, I've said, are the forerunner of the false prophet of speaking what at that time the man of lawlessness will do. He will control the media and the false prophet will control them. You see that today with the networks. If you're sitting down, listen to the primary networks and believe they're telling you the truth. I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, they're scripted. They, they go by what they're told. There is no more uh, proper news that they present to you. They present to you what they want you to hear and uh, how they want you to believe. Uh, from what we've had as the foundation and I've said of the church in the first century, look at where we're at today. It has changed so much. And I talked about that uh, right before Christmas. The basic Christian living, it's, it's not the same as it was. Um, we've deviated so far from where we were as a nation. 
uh, the founding guidelines and principles of this nation that I'm sure our forefathers, they wouldn't even recognize it. And it's done with a purpose. Uh, from the time that the United States, and even go back to Genesis 3, from the time that man was made and created in the image of God, it was the intention of the fallen cherub, Lucifer, to destroy or pollute mankind. It goes back to Genesis 3. The Nakash is what that serpent is called, the shining one, like brass. So it's the Nakash. So uh, hope for America, maybe better yet, the, the fading hope for America as a whole, for the ecclesia, for the true followers of Jesus Christ. Every day we have hope and belief in him. He is our shepherd. He's never going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He loves us. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. And that is belief and trust that we can count on. He is a God. He is a covenant-keeping God. Look to Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Fading hope for America or bright hope for America? This is what Jesus said. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Verse 25. And the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And so are you. The ecclesia. He told Peter, upon this rock, on this truth, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 7, verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them not will be like a foolish man or woman who built his or her house on the sand. So they're not following what he said to do. They're not following scripture. They're following other things, magical and whimsical and new age. It says, and the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great and complete was its fall. So if you build your house on sand and the waves come, thinking of life, you build your life on anything other than Jesus Christ, and the Holy Word of God, the inspired Word of God, and difficulties come, what are you going to turn to? And we see that with our uh, friends and colleagues that often they'll, you know, drugs and alcohol and affairs, and they get so caught up in earning money and staying busy. Um, I think part of the, the problem with America is we no longer sit around the kitchen table and talk about life. We don't sit around the kitchen table and remember or, or talk about God the way uh, it, it was years and years ago. Uh, by the grace of God, uh, Kimberly and Luke and I, we still do that. Uh, we set a time every evening that we sit down and eat. And as I've said, Kimberly, my beautiful bride, she's a wonderful cook and she makes, we, we eat home cooked meals. Um, so I, there's a lot that we missed out on by, and you know, and I'm glad they play soccer and all these other sports, but from the time they get out of school and they're running all over the, the place and stopping eating fast food, and you get home at nine or ten, you're exhausted and go to sleep, and it repeats. It's just different. So that word rock, look at the word rock. He built himself on a rock. That's the Greek word 4073, 4073. Metaphorically. Uh, a man or a woman, like a rock, by reason of his or her firmness and strength of soul. That's what he's talking about, built upon that rock. What he's talking about in uh, metaphorically is that you have a firmness and strength of your soul. And I have said about your soul, mind, will, and emotions. That is what the spirit feeds, is the soul. The soul is a, is a battleground between the carnal mind and the spirit. So the soul has to be fed by the spirit. The word fall uh, is the Greek 4431 
It occurs just two times in the New Testament that many may fall and bring upon themselves uh, ruin the loss of salvation and utter misery. That's what this word means, uh, this word fall in this particular um, scripture. Bring upon themselves and ruin the loss of salvation, bring upon them ruin and the loss of salvation and utter fall. It's like in Luke 2.34 uh, when Simeon uh, was in the temple. He said, Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the rising of many in Israel. He was talking about spiritually. He's talking about, you know, the spiritual, what Jesus would do. He would see the rise and fall of many spiritually uh, in that. So that's on a rock. We saw the sand and to build your foundation scripture on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants 2023 for you to have an intimate relationship with him. It's, it's, I've said before, it's like dating. You have to spend the time, whether it's a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, uh, male and female, that you have to spend time with them. Show them that you care. You want to be around them. Um, you do things with them because you just want to be with them. You are at that time either falling in love or in love. That's the way it is with Jesus. That's the only way that I just, spent time with him and you develop a relationship with him because he wants that. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to believe it. He wants it more than we do. So sometimes it will be a, that small, quiet voice. And sometimes it will be the thunder. So let's look at Nineveh. Two books of the Bible speak of Nineveh, the book of Jonah, recounted as salvation in the book of Nahum, prophesied and described as doom. Uh, Nineveh was an ancient city in upper Mesopotamia, located on the eastern bank of the Tigris River. First mentioned in 1800 BC, Nineveh was the largest, uh, it was the capital, and it was the largest and most populous of the uh, Neo-Assyrian Empire, as well as the largest city it had approximately 120,000. I believe that's what the Lord said, uh, but there were more in that surrounding area. It was uh, twice the size of Babylon. So why are you coming Nineveh? We'll see. Today, the ancient city uh, is inhabited by Sunnis and the Kurds, uh, and it's located uh, in the modern uh, day city of Mosul, M-O-S-U-L, in northern Iraq, we may remember that from the different campaigns that our military had to go through there. Uh, so, as I said, it was first mentioned in 1800, and it was the seat of pagan and idol worship, especially Bel and Ishtar. And I talked about both Bel. I've talked about Ishtar, and I'll get back to that when I uh, talk about Babylon again. Now, Babylon is when they uh, built the tower. They wanted to open a gateway into the heavens of the gods. Gateway to the gods is what it was called, and I'll talk about that more. So about um, Nineveh, King Ninus, N-I-N-U-S, wife Semiraeus. Well, Semiraeus is the wife of, or was the wife of Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod uh, died, and then they had, uh, she had a miraculous son called Tammuz, but I'll talk about that another time. But this Nimus, same as Nimrod, was the founder of the ancient city of Assyria uh, in Nineveh. There were numerous things credited to him, such as being the first uh, to train dogs for human uh, hunting and horses for riding, giving him the symbol of the centaur in the Greek mythology. Um, King Ninus was also said to have been the son of Baal. Uh, which many mean Lord in the Semitic uh, language. So Nineveh, it was the largest, uh, it was the capital city, largest population, and it was a pagan city known for idol worship. It had many temples in it, uh, to Bel and to Ishtar. You'll know that name, Diana, and others in other different religions. So in the Old Testament, let's look at Genesis 10, 8 through 12 for 
the Bereans. Cush became the father of Nimrod. I have a reason for covering this today, and you'll see. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. Talk about that. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. I'm going to clarify that just a minute. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, Akeda, Kalna, in the land of Shinar, which is in Babylonia. So Babylon would be the capital. Shinar would be like the county, if, if you were looking at geographic-wise. So Babylon and then Shinar, the area of Shinar. Verse 11. From that land, uh, Nimrod went to Assyria and built Nineveh. The real both, I, Kala, uh, verse 12. And Nimrod built Resin, which is between Nineveh and Kala. And these combined to form the great city of Nineveh. So there were about five cities within that area. It's kind of like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah with the different cities around it. So let's look at that word, mighty one. It's the Hebrews 1368. Is Gabor, G-I-B-B-O-R, or a giant. We will see when I teach about Genesis 6, that word is going to come up again. Gaborum. Uh, we'll talk about that with Nephilim. Giant, mighty, and hunting is that word. G I B B O R I M is a class of beings is used in Genesis 6 4 to describe Nephilim as mighty. They translated it because, and I'll talk about this uh, later, into giant because it sounded similar to giant. They were giants, but that's not the translation of the word. The word actually means ne Nephilim. So with that, we'll look Temple of Bell. You say, well, why cover this? This is history. The Temple of Baal, right, with Nimrod and Nineveh, which was a pagan area a city known for its uh, idol worship. So as you can see, and I had talked, to, I had taught on this before, but just as a review for some that may not have seen the teaching, the Temple of Baal is coming to New York and London. This has been a while back. 3D reconstruction of the altar of Satan and child sacrifice. Okay. Well, now I'm tying Nineveh, Babylon into what they're doing September 26th through the 30th, 2018. A reconstruction of the ancient arch of Palmyra, P A L M Y R A. We see that in Revelations, and we'll talk about Revelations, the seven churches there, it was set up in Washington, D.C. to celebrate global cultural heritage, according to the Institute of Digital Archaeology. The arch has also been displayed at various locations around the world, including New York City, London, and Dubai. Baal, B-A-A-L, or B-E-L, is mentioned more times in the Bible than any other false deity. Baal was a god of power, fertility, and child sacrifice. And New York and Washington, D.C. are the two key cities behind Ocean On Demand in America. Boy, what a coincidence. So they put that thing up in uh, these cities. There is writing on uh, both sides of the arch, ancient writing, same on leaving and coming in, so that this was described as a gateway or a portal to a different dimension, the dimension that allowed in demonic powers. You say, Tim, that's crazy. So they believe it. Um, and if you think those things are foolish, I hope and pray that you start studying and at least be open to listening um, for something that is presented to you. Uh, you can look at it and say, that's what we see all around us. That is what Hollywood is presenting to us. I'll give you a hint about Hollywood. Hollywood, uh, many of them have to take blood oaths and they do the pentagram and sacrifices and blood covenant uh, for fame and, and fortune. Uh, but Hollywood too often tips its hand on, on what they're doing, what they're thinking. Um, the word uh, Illuminati used to never be mentioned. And now in movies, the word Illuminati 
uh, Doctor Strange and, and other places is uh, just mentioned. They have they feel that they have progressed so far in their goal towards a one world government, one world religion, one world currency that they don't care anymore. But this is uh, a fact that happened. So that is on um, Nimrod and one other thing, just as I thought you'd find of interest, uh, the story of the skins of Jehovah that uh, are God provided for Adam and Eve and how they eventually were given to Nimrod. Uh, Noah, that was passed down to Noah and one of his sons stole it from him and then they were given to Nimrod. Also, some scholars uh, posit that Nimrod actually came from a Semitic root, a, a language similar to ancient Hebrew. It just The root appears to be a word roughly romanized as M-A-R-A-D, meaning to rebel. Yes, it means to rebel. Uh, and we'll see this word. You say, well, Jim, Nimrod is the Hebrews 5248 rebellion. And if you see that, when I said that, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, that's a mistranslation. He was a mighty hunter against the Lord and led those in uh, Babel, uh, Babylon to rebel against the Lord. And that's what the uh, Tower of Babel was, a gateway to the gods to oppose uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our God that created. They brought the flood. And you can see uh, in the translation against human uh, kind, against God, and fight against it was he said he was a mighty hunter among men actually uh, with dogs and with horses on horseback he was a mighty hunter against men um, as not only sport but to destroy those that opposed his one world government he was the first world leader one world government so that's why i talk about nimrod and you see nimrod here and in the abomination of desolation uh, there will be a second i you know call him Nimrod or whatever you want to call him, but uh, the beginning was Babylon. And if you, as I teach you revelation, so is revelation. Because of this, Nimrod often uh, is thought to have been a rebel against the Lord. And that's what the word uh, says. The phrasing in the Bible that says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, uh, Genesis 10, 9, might more literally be translated to the face of the Lord. In other words, in opposition to God, this possible translation may back up uh, Nimrod's name as the rebel. Rebellion is his name. And you can see that in Hebrews 5248. The Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation, Genesis 10, 8 through 9, and Cush procreated Nimrod. This one began to be a giant, is what they call him, a giant upon the earth. So many thought that Nimrod was a giant. This one was a giant hunter with hounds before the Lord. On account of this, they say Nimrod, a giant hunter with hounds before the Lord. And that would be, again, a giant against the Lord. So let's look at, before I move into the other, um, the dove, Jonah. <laughs> uh, Jonah, his, mean, his name means the dove. But let me talk about this in just a second. In Judaism, the story of Jonah, or the dove, represents the teaching of Teshuvah, T-E-S-H-U-V-A, which we'll cover uh, a little bit later. He is regarded as a prophet in Islam, and the biblical narrative of Jonah is repeated in the Quran uh, and also, obviously, in, in our Bible. In the New Testament, Jesus calls himself greater than Jonah and promises the Pharisees the sign of Jonah, which is his resurrection. So we're going to talk a little bit today about Jonah, thus my introduction and background on Nineveh. Jesus and the sign, Matthew 12, 38 through 41, for those Librarians, I, I thank you. So many now that are taking notes and journaling and, and having the, like your own diary, your own teaching. It's, I emphasize over, and it's, it's going to be very important for you to have your own text to be able to go to and study and to review these. And you make that decision. I'm presenting to you 
scriptures and what I believe the uh, word says and going back to the original text. Matthew uh, 12, 38 through 41. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees said to him, teacher, <laughs> we want to see a sign. They wanted to see a miracle and testing uh, that, you know, to prove that he was actually who, you know, he, he was from God. He says, proving that you are who you claim to be. Verse 39. But he replied and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves and demands a sign, a miracle, but no sign will be given to it, except <laughs> he, he liked playing with them. The sense of humor of the Lord, but he also, he has wit. But no sign will be given to it, except, a pretty important word, the sign of the prophet Jonah. He says Jonah was a prophet, so we know that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah and was a prophet. Verse 40, and just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You can't get from Friday to Sunday and make it three days. It doesn't work. Jesus said, I will be in the earth three days and three nights. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up as a witness at the judgment against this generation and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here or someone greater than Jonah is here. So he was saying, you won't repent and someone greater than Jonah, the prophet is here, the prophet Jesus Christ, the son of God, yet Nineveh repented. So what do we see? One of the greatest prophets during the time of Jeroboam II was Jonah, the son of Amida, A-M-I-T-T-A-I, -T -T the tribe of Zebulun. So this is Jonah. The dove was born uh, in Gath Heper, which, is the, which means the wine press or the digging of a well, a town of lower Galilee about five miles from Nazareth about the 8th century B.C. Jonah had anointed Jehu, thereby enjoying the king's uh, benevolence a little bit on Jonah. So why would I have a picture of Chrislam up here? Unfortunately, many Bible scholars and theologians regard the book of Jonah as fictional. St. Augustine and Martin Luther regard the story of Jonah as the epitome of envy and jealousy, which they regarded as inherent characteristics of the Jewish people. Luther likewise concludes that the Kayaka, K-I-K-A-Y-O-N, the Hebrew name of a plant, and we'll talk about that plant, represents Judaism, the plant that grew up over Jonah when he was on the hill looking over Nineveh. He said that plant represents Judaism, and the worm that devours the plant represents Christ. So this is St. Augustine and Martin Luther from the Reformation period. Luther also questioned the idea that the book of Jonah was ever intended as literal history, commenting that he found it hard to believe that anyone would have interpreted it as such if it had not been included in the Bible. Well, it is in the Bible, and the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed it. Luther's anti-Semitic interpretation of Jonah reminded uh, the prevailing interpretation among German Protestants uh, throughout the early modern history. Similarly, J.D. Michaels comment that the meaning of the fable hits you right between the eyes and concludes that the book of Jonah is a diatribe against the Israelite people's hate and envy towards all other nations. John Calvin and John Hooper regard the book of Jonah as a warning. Now, this is their interpretation to all those who might attempt to flee from the wrath of God. While Luther has been careful to maintain that the book of Jonah was not written by Jonah, <laughs> Jesus just confirmed it was, Calvin declared that the book of Jonah was his confession of guilt 
Uh, Calvin sees Jonah's time inside the fish's belly as equivalent to the fires of hell, intended to correct Jonah and to set him on the path of righteousness. Also, unlike Luther, uh, Calvin finds fault with all the characters in the story describing the sailors on the boat as hard and iron-hearted like Cyclops, C-Y-C-L-O-P-S. Uh, and the penitence of the Ninevites is untrained and the king of uh, in, in the story is a novice. And so uh, just, and there's others. I'll, I'll, these will be in the notes for National War Council members. Uh, it just how they can take something and twist it or mock it. This is, uh, they call him St. Augustine. The Catholic Church made him a saint. Uh, but Augustine, Luther, uh, Calvin, some of these. So I put that in there with these just to say, when you see today, there are many that will discredit Scripture, that will try and twist Scripture uh, for their own liking. I'm telling you that ahead this year again, just to remind you and keep you alert. Uh, I put this section as believing in a literal, this is for me and for my family, I believe in a literal Interpretation of the scriptures, uh, God says what he means and means what he says. Subjections and conjecture fall outside the realm of serious scholarship. For we read where the Lord himself attested to it historically. Matthew 12, uh, 39 through 41, Luke 11, 29 through 32, and removed all doubt about the record. Jesus referenced Jonah as a prophecy and Jonah as a prophet of his resurrection. To deny the historical fact of Jonah is actually to deny uh, Jesus and his resurrection. So there's always angles that they try to get to uh, criticize the death, the burial of the three days and resurrection. You know that Good Friday is Dagon when they celebrate for the fish and then Easter Sunday, which I've talked about. So you have today, just to touch on this, chrysalum, what we've talked about. This is a reality. It's happening. It's not something futuristic. Uh, I'll talk about this uh, in two or three sessions from now. Chrysalum, right? We're talking about the Nicolaitans and to be aware of it. Uh, Jesus talks about it in Revelation 2.6. And 215, I'll go through the seven churches and where they set themselves in the history of the church. So the Nicolaitans, that's the Judaism, the church, the Catholic church, Islam coming together with a pope, Christian today. Those are the buildings that they're working on right now in Dubai. But let's look at this. And this is one I talked about that. Um, in the future, with the Nicolaitans, when God hates something, be aware of it. Pay attention to it. And I take you back when God told me to start the National War Council in 2018. said, do not do it as a 501c3. He knows what's coming. And he'll show his prophets that. Uh, there will, and we saw it, and we see it today, uh, proper words that you can use. And if you use the wrong words, then they will boycott your uh, corporation. They will boycott your product or they will do the other. They will come and ravage your store or your storefront. Or if you disagree with them, uh, they will say a lot of bad things about you, uh, period. Uh, there is no tolerance. There is no dialogue. There's simply hatred spewed. And I have talked about it over and over. Just simply look at Saul Alinsky and Rules for Radicals. They're following it to the T, and people are doing it now not even knowing about the Rules for Radicals. But the Johnson Amendment is a provision. The U.S. Tax Code, I want you to see it, and it's up there for you to, to read, that prohibits all 501c3 nonprofit organizations, universities, organizations, churches, from endorsing or opposing political candidates. You can also add to that what is proper speech now, because now with um, 
what they're doing, social justice, they will identify certain terms uh, that are hate speech now. And so as the days go by, and we will see they're doing it uh, today, uh, reminds me, by the way, on the farmers, uh, the Biden administration very secretly and very subtly uh, revoked one of Trump's uh, uh, amendments that he put in that the water on farms are back under the regulation of the EPA so that they can come in. If there's a ditch or your pond or your lake on your uh, farm, they can now go in and that falls under the EPA, which causes a tremendous amount of legal problems for farmers uh, from the EPA. And it's been proven Trump undid that and Biden just uh, very discreetly uh, reimposed it. Back to so the paragraph three, and I'll just it says corporations in any community chest fund or foundation organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, scientific testing. So just to be aware that there is a provision in the tax code that confirms, and what I have shown to you about the Nicolaitans eventually will be part of it will be the structured church the structured religious organizations that kowtow to the government because they want to keep their benefits. They want to keep all their assets. They want to continue that lifestyle. So they will, and we've seen it all over the nation uh, as they did with the mandates that they will follow what the government tells them to do because they do not want to lose their privileges. Look it up. I didn't make these things up. So, go back to Jonah. Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, uh, the son of Amida, saying, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim judgment against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3. But Jonah <laughs> ran away to Tarshish to escape from the presence of the Lord. His duty as a prophet. Jesus called him a prophet. He was a prophet. The Lord said, I want you to go and you know, bring, tell them judgment's coming. He didn't want to do it. He went down to Joppa, modern Jaffa, J-A-F-F-A in Israel. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, about 2,500 miles uh, from there. If you go by, you know, by sea, it is a long trip in the opposite direction. So he paid the fare and went down into the ship to go with the sailors to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Uh, Nineveh said, uh, basically, go northeast, and Jonah went west. So what happened? After casting lots, you know that they had a terrible storm uh, out in that area, and the ship was about to... They threw all the cargo and things over, and the ship was about to capsize. And so th they figured something was wrong, and they cast lots. So after casting lots uh, to these sailors who undoubtedly believed in their pagan gods, the casting of lots was a way to allow their gods to express themselves since only they could control how the lot fell. In this case, of course, we know uh, that Jehovah, our God, intervened. Look at Proverbs 16.33. For the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision outcome is from the Lord. So Jonah didn't have a real chance. When they cast lots, it was him. So they decided to, uh, I'll, I'll share what that is, Jonah 1.15. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. They <laughs> jumped him overboard, and the sea stopped his raging. Okay, God was getting his way. Verse 16, then the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, made vows. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared, appointed, destined a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Salvation of Gentiles, right? Gentiles. This is a Jew, a prophet from Israel, going to the Gentiles the most 
pagan city in the world at that time, the most populous city in the world at that time. So as we read, Jonah was commanded to forewarn the population of Nineveh, the pagan Gentiles, of their pending destruction. Nevertheless, as Nineveh was a bitter enemy of Israel at the time, the prophet would rather have seen God's judgment on the city. They were Gentiles. They were uh, a warlike people. And in the future, it would be that the Assyrians and the Babylonians would take part in uh, God's judgment against Israel. He knew if the pagan idol worshiping citizens truly repented, Nineveh would be res- um, would be spared and remain a constant threat to his to his nation Israel. We know at that point that Jonah chose to ignore God's command and get as far away from Nineveh as possible. So the prophet boarded the ship and got in Joppa and set sail to Tarshish. Um, some say that it actually and and new archaeological archaeology has proven that uh, even the British Isles, which is further away, did extensive trading in that area. It says, though art and culture often depict Jonah's fish as a whale, the account in Matthew identifies uh, the belly as the Greek word 2836 as the lower region. The whale is a sea monster, a huge fish uh, gaping for prey. So he says it identifies that he was in the lower uh, extremities of this great sea monster. It's the only time it's used. Whale is the uh, Greek 2785, if you want to see that. It's sea monster or a huge fish that's gaping, searching for prey. Uh, the, <laughs> the Hebrew text reads Dag Gadol, uh, which is Hebrew 7, 1709, which means the great fish. Uh, the Septuagint translates this phrase into Greek, uh, meaning a huge fish, and goes on. So again, these are, are again. Um, so while some biblical scholars suggest the size and the habits of the great white shark correspond better to the representations of Jonah's experience, normally an adult human is too large to be swallowed whole. The development of whaling from the 18th century onward made it clear that most, if not all, species of whale could not swallow a human, leading to much controversy about the veracity of the biblical story of Jonah. So that's a different view. And if God says he sent a great sea monster, that whatever it was to swallow Jonah and spit him out, that's what he did. So in Jonah, when you uh, disobey the Lord, and instead of going northeast, you go in the opposite direction, west, and you're in the lower extremity of this uh, huge sea monster, uh, you might want to pray before. Uh, many say it's, it's spit it out. My belief is as Jesus was in the grave, uh, and, and I don't see uh, how Jonah survived three days and three nights with the acidity and, and digestive tract of, of a great uh, fish that would take to swallow him, survived, but he was spit out, and I personally believe it was a sign of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as he was resurrected from the dead. So, But before that, Jonah 2, 1 through 9, Jonah prayed in the Lord's God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried before my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, he cried. And for Jonah, it says, I think seaweed, and thou heard my voice. If you cast me deep into the mid the seas and the floods compass me about, all thy billows and thy waves pass me over. And then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again to thy holy temple. This is faith. Verse 5, the waters compass me about even to the soul. The death closed me around with the weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth and her bars were about me forever. So no matter how deep uh, this fish that had grasped him went down, symbolic of where his soul went down. He says in verse 9, But I will sacrifice un- unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving, uh, praying for repentance and praising the Lord for uh, forgiving him. And so we can see uh, that that, great fish sea monster spit him out and as i said 
uh, I believe it was as Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the first one. Uh, the Old Testament uh, will show what is to come. Uh, some have said the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. So, so you can either do it God's way, or you can do it God's way. Either way, he's going to have his way. He says what he means and means what he says. Romans, and this is for you, this is for me, is if I have been disobedient or if you have been disobedient and we repent and we truly turn from that and ask him to forgive us and give as the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, he forgives us. For me, it took me forever to stop. Stop beating yourself up. Jim was harder on Jim than the Lord was. And I, a lady one time prophesied to me, didn't know anything about me. First time I ever saw her, she said, the Lord says you're harder on yourself than I am. And it confirmed what he'd been telling me all along. And I'm telling you the same thing. Stop beating yourself up over something you've done. If God says forgiven you, forgive yourself. He says 70 times seven is what he told Peter. James says, you know, it's the, it's the, um, way of forgiveness confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness and about your calling uh, I've heard years and years ago a person came and was preaching at church and said I was God's uh, you know third pick the first one and second one turned it down that's not scriptural it's not scriptural at all it sounds good uh, it sounds like pride but that's not that's, you know false pride but that's that's not what it says look at romans eleven twenty nine, and this is for you this particular part is for you if you get anything else get this today for the gifts and the calling of god are irrevocable for he does not withdraw what he has given nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call or his gifts romans eleven twenty nine. So take that for yourself. If you continue to sin and live a, a life, a habitual life of sin, you are under the judgment. But when you are doing your best, and it's like I was in some of the special op training, I'd put you out in the water and, and see if you could survive out in the water and you're treading water and doing everything you could to survive and floating on your back and trying to keep your nose above the water. And yet you, you, you've, Thought at any time you were going to drown because you were exhausted. In this case, you're trying to do that. You know, out there, if you're living that life of sin, it's not going to work. Simply say, Lord, I have sinned and I ask you to forgive me. And he is faithful and just to forgive you. And the call that you have on your life, every one of you have a divine purpose in your life. No one is forgotten. So if you get anything else, please get that that you have a divine call on your life in whatever capacity it is. If you're, whatever you're doing, if, if, if you're a carpenter like he was, be the best carpenter you can. If you're running a, a large corporation, do what is right and treat people fairly. Treat them the way you want to be treated. That's what God wants us to do. He boiled all the commandments down to that. You know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and treat Others as you would want to be treated. That's a take care of things. Excuse me. So Jonah in Nineveh. Let's go to there and get to the point for today. Jonah 3, 1 through 4. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. <laughs> he spit him out and said, go to Nineveh. Oh, by the way, you're at the doorway that great city and declare it to the message, which I'm going to tell you. Okay. Verse three. So Jonah went to Nineveh for the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three day walk, about 60 miles in circumference. Verse four. Then on the first day's walk, Jonah began to go through the city and he called out and said, 40 days more. And then Nineveh will be overthrown. <laughs> I don't think that Jonah went into Nineveh with a sweet message and preempted it with a lot of, I think he was just blunt. 
uh, went in and said, you got 40 days and you did. Uh, judgment's coming. It was a pagan city, had idols all over the place, uh, a place of child sacrifice and every other abomination. These were Gentiles. He was a Jewish prophet from Israel. And later, as I said, Assyria would uh, destroy the top uh, 10 tribes. And then later Babylon, uh, Judah and Benjamin in the lower. So if you look forward as a prophet and know that, you're not going in there with a sweet message. It was probably as blunt as can be. Uh, 40 days and you're judged. So let's talk about 40 days, right? So there's Nineveh. 40 days. It's mentioned 146 times in scripture. And the number 40 symbolizes a period of testing, a trial, or probation. God flooded the earth by having it rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis 7, 12. After the patriarch Jacob uh, died in Egypt, the Egyptians spent 40 days embalming his body. Another 40-day period. Genesis 50, verse 3. A generation of man. Because of their sins after leaving Egypt, God swore that the generation of Israelites who left Egypt uh, Egyptian bondage will not enter into their inheritance in the Canaan, anyone that was 20 and over. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1. The children of Israel were punished by wandering the wilderness for 40 years before a new generation was allowed to possess the land. Uh, you know that Joshua and Caleb were faithful when they went to spy out the land, and uh, Joshua actually you know, went into the Jericho. Uh, well, he sent people into Jericho, but when he went to spy out the land. During Moses' life, he lived for 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert, and then God selected him uh, to lead them 40 years in the wilderness. So each of those 40s uh, were symbolic. Just tell you some of the things on 40. Uh, Exodus 24, 18, and uh, 34, 1 through 28. Uh, on, he went to Mount Sinai, uh, where he went up into the mountain for 40 days. 40 nights, two different occasions. He also sent spies for 40 days to investigate the land that God promised the Israelites as an inheritance. That's uh, two of them that came back with a good report. And, and what did they say when they, when they had the report? There are giants. That word actually they used, they, they, they came back and said, there's Nephilim in the land. And we were the size of grasshopper. I said, locusts. We're the size of locusts in their sight. So they had reason to be afraid. It, it wasn't just... You know, they didn't want to do it. But Joshua and Caleb came back and said, if God said we can do it, we're going to do it. Um, some of the things, Prophet uh, Ezekiel laid on his right side for 40 days to symbolize Judah's sin, Ezekiel 4 through 6, 4, 6. Elijah uh, went 40 days uh, without food or water on Mount Horeb. You know that Jesus was tempted uh, many times during the 40, 40 days that he fasted before his ministry. Uh, he also appeared to his disciples and others for 40 days after his resurrection. And just days before his crucifixion, uh, Jesus prophesied the destruction uh, of Jerusalem, Matthew 24, 1 through 2. And 40 years after his crucifixion, uh, 30 AD, Vespasian, son, uh, General Titus, I talked about this, destroyed the fortress Masada in Jerusalem in 70 AD fulfilling the prophetic word and just some trivial Josephus places the siege at 70 year uh, during that uh, 70 AD uh, in the second year of Vespasian. He was actually the one that began it, went, had to go to Rome because of the Caesar had died. He became uh, Caesar and his son Titus was uh, given the responsibility of destroying uh, Jerusalem. And they took in, uh, the 5th Legion, the 12th Legion, and the 15th Legion, the 10th Legion, the Romans. The 5th was the Macedonian religion, uh, Legion. Uh, the 12th was called the Thunderbolt. Uh, the 15th was called Apollo's Legion. And then the 10th Legion, the Strait, is uh, wanted on the Mount of Olives. So they surrounded and destroyed it. And we saw where the prophet uh, Jonah prophesied that in 40 days, you're done. 
why 40 days? And I'll cover that in a second. But to let you know um, <laughs> the simple truth, understanding the pathway or seaway which led Jonah to Nineveh's message of the pronouncement of judgment was straightforward. No compassion, no mercy, soothing or itching ear message. It was blunt, brutal, and to the point. Probably like I do the best I know in love uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the truth is the truth. Jonah 3, 5 through 10, I won't read all of it. The people of Nineveh believed and trusted in God, and they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, and the greatest king, even to the least of them, the slaves, when word reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in the dust in repentance. And he issued a proclamation that there are no ones to drink water or eat. Uh, even the, the cattle, the, the animals, all of them, he proclaimed a fast to everyone. And verse 9, he says, who knows, God may turn in compassion and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. All throughout the world, uh, when the reputation of God, when you look at Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and when they went into the land, and when Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. The people in Jericho said, we heard how God, and this is 40 years earlier, we heard how God had, what he had done to Egypt, the plagues, and how he parted uh, the sea for you. So there was a fear of God throughout the earth because of his miracles. It's going to happen again, by the way. The fear of God will be when he brings, think of the 10 uh, Miracle of the plagues that God brought in uh, Egypt. Look at Revelation and uh, on your own, and then I'll cover that when we get to it. Verse 10, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways. This is very important. When God saw their deeds, they turned from their wicked way. Then God had compassion and relented concerning the disaster, which he had declared that he would bring upon them. So he didn't do it. He did not bring judgment. They lasted another hundred years. Jonah 4, 10 to Then the word said, you have compassion on the plant. So he went up to look at the city and waited for it to be destroyed. He wanted it to be destroyed. And my point in saying this, not everyone rejoices when you repent and, and turn away from wickedness. There are others that, or a hope that you are judged and bring destruction. I'm talking about on the Christian, the true believer, not uh, the heathen that uh, will bring it upon themselves. The Lord said, you have compassion on the plant. This he got up there and this little plant grew up overnight. Those that know the story and it gave him shade. And he was really happy over it. Um, and God said, and he got uh, very upset because the next day a worm came, ate the plant and it, destroyed it and took away his shade and so he got mad and I put this he said then the Lord said you have compassion on the plan for which you did not work and which you now see grow which came up and perished overnight so he had asked Jonah right before this he goes do you have the right to be angry Jonah said I have the right to be angry into death one of five people that had talked about his own death should I not also have compassion on Nineveh and you can see there are more than 120,000 people, and that's that number that I had given to you. So let's talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, and then we'll move to our close. Sodom and Gomorrah were cities founded and developed uh, by the wicked Canaan and his uh, descendants. The Canaanites were known for their sexual debauchery, their vile sex gods, and their lascivious worship services. Uh, you may recall that Noah placed a curse on Canaan. Um, Remember when Ham came in, did what he did, but he cursed Canaan for his despicable sin against him. I'll talk about that one day. Jude 7 says, even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, there were five of them, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, 
uh, bestiality, are set forth a, an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There were other sins in addition to sexual ones. Ezekiel sixteen forty nine through fifty says they they were prideful, abundant in idleness, they were selfish, and did not help those who were poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abomination before me. This is what Ezekiel is quoting about God talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. So pride and God hates pride. That's, you know, with Lucifer and uh, the king of Tyre and how he was fallen from heaven. The Lord sent two angels down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18. We have an account of the angels visiting Abraham on their way. The Lord also appeared to Abraham and tells him of the mission of the two angels. Genesis 18, 20, 21. And the Lord said, because of the outcry, again, I want you to listen to this. Because I am going to compare this. You saw what happened with Nineveh, the most egregious, the most pagan, populous city in the world of that time. And they were spared. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah came up before the Lord and he came down with two of his angels and on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, he stops and Abraham uh, provides them with some food and, and some uh, curds of milk. Genesis 18, 20 through 21. And the Lord said, because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together. He knew. God knows everything. He said, to the outcry against it that has come before me, and I will know. He came down to confirm, but he also, his purpose was to meet with Abraham. That's what I believe. And this is an example for us today. Abraham asked the Lord, and I do the same thing. Will thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? Abraham was thinking about his kinsman Lot and his family. When I pray for America, I think about you. I think about the bride of Christ. I think about so much difficulty, the hardships, not only economically. Uh, that, that's a difficulty, but just socially. Uh, we see what's happening in our schools. I have said that our educational system is completely compromised the judicial system is compromised and i posted something on facebook about uh, them trying to uh, appoint uh, mccarthy to be speaker of the house uh, let me say this i don't have any confidence in uh, the congress and today with you know a former president uh, vouching for a particular person I look back at, and see some of the different appointments he made uh, with the attorney general, the FBI, and the list goes on and on and on. I really wouldn't take a lot of confidence in who he recommends. Just a side note. Don't write me. I don't really care about Republican or uh, the Democrats, the liberals. Uh, compromised, corrupt. You can say, well, Jim, they just passed that omnibus. Another, we're at $31 trillion. They passed this monstrosity with McConnell and uh, so many other Republicans on board with it, the whole thing. And I put in there sewage. I don't want to insult the swamp. I haven't, you know, that I'm from Louisiana and I love the swamp area. And there are a lot of creatures in the swamp. I don't want to disparage them. Cause that don't write. But he was concerned about Lot and his family. I pray for you. I pray for my family. I want us to, uh, be light, and I want us to be salt in the earth, and I want the Lord to uh, recompense the blessing to us, 23, 23 and on. Abraham started negotiating. I, I you say, you can't negotiate with God. You, I want you to have a relationship with him and know him as a person. He is God Almighty to be worshiped, and you bow down and fall uh, before him. But the Lord Jesus Christ is also a, a man, a person. Abraham starts negotiating with the Lord. If you can find 50 righteous, and you know the story. Would you spare it? The Lord said, I'll, excuse me, I'll spare it for 50. I will spare all the people for their sake. 
Genesis 18, 20. Six, so Abraham continued to negotiate, Lord, and he, he got down to 10, which is the number for the Jewish of, of the uh, complete, the number for a group. 40, 30, 20, Genesis 18, 32. Abraham said, Lord, if I can find 10 righteous people in Sodom, Gomorrah, will you spare the cities? Or said, he will not destroy it for 10's sake. You can see Genesis 1820, Genesis 1924, Genesis 1928. Ten righteous people could have saved the lives of thousands of people, not to mention all the buildings in the city. The very sad part of the story is not even ten righteous people could be found in these cities. The only righteous people to be found or Lot and his small family. I would question his wife who turned back to that manner of life and turned into a pillar of salt. The angels told Lot and his family to get out of Sodom as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, or typically of the desire of the flesh, as they were leaving, Lot's wife disobeyed the Lord by looking back at the city as it was being destroyed by fire and brimstone. As punishment, she was turned into a pillar of salt. They still have that that tourists can see today. Only Lot and his two daughter, daughters escaped the destruction of the city. Flavius Josephus clearly describes that with the Dead Sea, uh, so Solomon's neighboring uh, country, he writes about the five cities in which uh, they are familiar with the traces of God's fire and traces of ash. At the time of Josephus, the cities were about 2,000 years old, so he's writing about them. It says, all five cities that Josephus uh, described are found today. All these cities are covered with whitest ash and sulfur, millions of sulfur balls strewn around. In addition to these five cities, ash and sulfur covered each one of them, of all of those areas. It says, when analyzed, the sulfur balls were found to contain 98% a purity of sulfur dust. In nature, this degree of pure sulfur powder does not appear anywhere in the world. Put in this for those that doubt. The combination found is unique, and scientists are unable to explain its origin. Cities uh, are preserved in, uh, today over 3,960 3, years to testify to the veracity of the biblical story. Sodom and Gomorrah, the three cities, were indeed destroyed by brimstone for their preservation today. I've seen several that have taught over the years. They bring back little balls of sulfur, and uh, you can even light them. So the population of the five cities, just to give you an idea, uh, some estimate, you know, with, with Sodom and Gomorrah, we saw that Nineveh was 120,000. They think Sodom and Gomorrah was as low as 50,000. Uh, others put the mid-range to be about half a million with all the five cities. And I've seen a couple that were over a million. I don't believe those at all. So I took out, remember, I'm, I'm low analytical. And it's the same way I teach. But if there, I took the low amount. If there's 50,000, right, which is the low amount in the five cities, and you took 10 people, then that would be 0.02% of the population are one in every 5,000. So what does that mean for us today? 336 million people. If we could find 67,000 or less than 100,000, 67,200, those are going to do some math on it. Take 0.02% uh, times our population today. And you can see uh, what it comes out and uh, ironically, how many in 5,000 need, need to be saved. Uh, born again, following Jesus Christ in America. So I put this down to say 100,000. I know that there are that many um, <laughs> probably that watch, and I know on other broadcasts uh, around the world, but in the United States of America, born again, truly following Jesus Christ in this nation. Um, and I will cover what you and I need to do. So the word... That was Sodom and Gomorrah. You can see the size of it. Probably a lot more than 50,000, but I just took the lower amount. So even that number would go down 
if you you know if you put half a million and only needed ten, God prefers mercy over judgment. God prefers mercy over judgment. He would prefer mercy as he showed to Nineveh. It was a pagan city, but they repented. Why am I saying that? The United States of America, we can. There is hope for America. <laughs> now my thing ain't working at it. Bit off of his own. Come on. There you go. Look at this word. It is, I said we'd come back to it. Teshuvah is the way you pronounce it. T-E-S-H-U-V-A-H. -E it's a repentance in Jewish teaching. I'll cover that in one other. After being cast on the ship, Jonah is swallowed by a large fish within the belly of which he remains for three days and three nights. And so God commands him to vomit out. In Hebrew, the term Teshuvah translates as return. It describes the return of God along with our fellow human beings made possible through repentance of our sins. This is the Jewish teaching. Teshuvah is most frequently associated with the high holy days, especially the 10 days of awe of repentance just before Yom Kippur. Okay. So in Jewish tradition, the process of atonement has four clear defined stages. I'm going to cover this to show you where you and I are and where this nation is and what we can do. This is a Jewish way. Step one, regret. Realize the extent of the damage and inward, inwardly adopt a feeling of sincere regret that for what you have done, for how you have sinned. Step two, ceasing. Immediately stop the harmful action. Three, Confession and restitution. Verbalize the mistake and ask for forgiveness, either from God or from the wrong party. Again, this is the Jewish uh, method of tushva. If possible, the wrong must be righted through compensation. If the sin is against God, acts of charity may be considered restitution. Step four, make a firm commitment not to repeat the sin in the future. So this is for uh, the Jewish mindset, the Jewish culture, and the uh, days leading up to Yom Kippur each year. And it's part of what I teach. They go through this process of searching themselves out and seeing if they have sinned against another or if they have sinned against God. The Jews have this in there that they can uh, try and bring restitution to someone they have offended. Okay. Are there sins for which there is no atonement? This is according to the Jews. Because Teshua requires the sinner to ask forgiveness of the person they have offended, it has been argued that a murderer cannot be forgiven for his or her crime since there is no way to ask the wrong played or the wrong party for forgiveness. Some scholars argue that murder is a sin for which no atonement is possible. I'll debate that. Two other offenses come close to being unpardonable, defrauding the public and slander. Ruining a person's good name. I mentioned this on purpose. In both cases, it is nearly impossible to track down every person who is, who is affected by the offense to offer an apology and request forgiveness. Many Jewish scholars characterize these sins, Jewish scholars, murder, slander, and public fraud as the only unpardonable sins. I said when you uh, speak slander against another, it's almost like getting a feathered pillow and cutting it open and going to the window and letting the feathers blow out the window. And then when you repent, trying to get all those feathers back and put them back in the pillow is impossible. But we are not of the Jewish mindset that I have just covered. So you would have that. We are under the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is not a license to sin. It's not a license to continue to living in sin. It is there for those that want to repent and turn away from sin 
and have the peace and have the creator of the universe console and comfort and affirm his presence with you. The United States of America, days of repentance. Thought on this, is there hope for America? Second Chronicles 7.14 And my people, so my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear them from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Seek is to, he says, seek my face is to crave and to require of necessity. My people, I'll break this down and then give you the translation. My people is the Hebrews 1862. It speaks of a people, a tribe, or a nation. Speaking to those in the United States of America. Call by my name, Hebrews 1721. It actually denotes ownership of a person. Is the Lord God, does he own you? Are you his? Are you his son? Are you his daughter? Humble themselves. Hebrews 3, 6, 6, 5. All of these are in the Strong's Concordance. To be contracted. We say humble themselves to be contracted, to be wrinkled. The picture of it is as an eagle folding its wings down. To humble itself, to fold its wings down. To pray. Hebrews 64, 19, generally, in a general term, pray but also intercede on behalf of others. You can pray for yourself, but you also intercede on behalf of others. My face, Hebrews 6440, to beseech his countenance, to turn towards him in seeking his countenance, his face. To turn, Hebrews 7725, to turn from evil and back to God. It's actually a term that says to be brought back. You went somewhere and you're going to be brought back, is that word turn. Wicked is Hebrews 663, deeds and action, evil, displeasing, and malignant. So if you're doing something that's evil and malig malignant is what it's talking about. Wicked way, the word way is Hebrews 705, and that talk about a, like a road, but it's a course of life. Uh, the feet talk about your way of life. Hands talk about the work and the actions that you do. So when you went to the labor, the priest went to the labor, and I'm talking to priests, they went to the labor at uh, Moses' tabernacle, and they washed their hands, which was symbolic of the work, and their feet, because it uh, was symbolic of their walk and their, their life. To forgive, pardon, uh, God visits punishment upon and heals, in other words, the consequences of backsliding, the hurts of a nation. And he gives favor, and he gives the, the land, the nation, victory from uh, what they, like Nineveh, the judgment they were under, that he removes that judgment, and in place of it, gives them peace and victory when they truly repent. So he forgives, he pardons. When God pardons, it's as though it never happened, as far as the east is from the west. So when I took all that, let me translate it in what I came up with says, if my people, I'm talking to you, isn't it ironic that Second Chronicles 7.14 doesn't say if Congress, it doesn't say if the judicial system, it doesn't say if the executive branch, doesn't say if the judicial branch, doesn't say any of those things. It says, if my people, this is on us, if my people will, not the government, the federal government, not the state government, not the Department of Education, if my people, make sure you understand that distinction. When the Lord is talking, he's talking about you. Excuse me. He's talking to me, to Luke and my beautiful bride, because we are his. We belong to him.
As for me and my house, the chapter said, we'll serve the Lord. If my people within a tribe or a nation who are owned by God be contracted and fold their wings as to be contracted in humility and pray, intercede on behalf of and seek to secure from God, our creator, beseeching his countenance and turn from evil and be brought back from evil, displeasing and the malignant course of life. Then he, our God will pardon and not visit the punishment of his wrath on the sins of this nation and give my favor to their land and territory. I took that from all the Hebrew words of what it means in Second Chronicles 714. You can look them up for yourself. If my people, tribe or nation who are owned by God be contracted and fold their wings and pray and intercede on behalf of and seek to secure from God, our creator beseeching his countenance and turn from evil and be brought back from evil, displeasing and malignant course of life. Then I will talk about God will pardon and not visit punishment of my wrath on their sin. And I will give my favor to their land and territory. This is not what I was going to cover. I was going to move into Genesis six and get into the different uh, aspects of that after Babylon and get into uh, different dimensions uh, and some of the things that are coming in 2023, 24, and 25. But this is where the Lord had me start, is many people are wondering, do we still, uh, is there a chance for America? And I believe there is, according to Scripture. Do I believe there would be nationwide revival? No. I, I would like to be wrong in that, but I know that revival comes like it did at Azusa Street from turning to the Lord and repenting. Um, he can do it any way he chooses. But I saw the example in the Bible where one city, Nineveh, the most egregious and uh, idolatrous uh, city on the face of the earth at the time, they repented and God turned away his judgment. One man went in and preached, and 120,000 plus repented, along with all the livestock and everything else. Then Sodom and Gomorrah, population anywhere from 50,000, with all the surrounding cities, up to higher than that. The Lord said, if I can find 10 righteous people, I will withhold my judgment. But I, know, I want you to understand this also. Prophetic insight, and please listen to this. Before the flood, Enoch was taken to heaven. Right? Enoch was taken to heaven. Before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, those that were righteous, Lot, his two daughters, and his wife, they were taken out. And then the destruction. Understand the prophetic in that. Understand the prophetic in that. And I'll talk about those that want to talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Um, harpazo is the word. Harpazo, the taking up, the catching up. We'll talk about that in 2023. Thank you again. I've missed you. I look forward to this. And I hope for next week that we also have communion start the year off. Uh, we get reports each time of people that were healed, uh, people that felt peace uh, and a sense of joy. So we will look for communion next time and I'll see where the Lord takes me. Um, but I want to thank you. I love you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to take notes and I want you to study and make decisions for yourself. Don't look to me because everything I try to do will be for the glory of Jesus Christ. If it's not for that, I'll stop. I'll go back to the cave. And that's what it's about. It's for teaching the body of Christ and also praying and hoping for this nation. So thank you. 
I pray for you, Kimberly, Luke. We, we pray for you. Pray for families. And we are the farmers in this great nation. God bless you until we see each other again.